When John Kennedy said his famous line, We choose to go to the moon. Speaking of the upcoming Apollo mission to the moon, he was not only talking about space, but also about the United States' quest for technological superiority, which Kennedy saw as a path to national security and leadership. Now his name adorns the second aircraft carrier of a new generation, USS John F. Kennedy, CVN-79, which appeared in an era when military technologies are becoming more compact and conflicts are becoming asymmetrical. This begs the question, can a ship designed to last more than 50 years adapt to the rapidly evolving threats of hypersonic weapons, swarming stealth drones, and orbital surveillance systems? Or will this floating giant simply become obsolete within a decade? Today we'll be trying to figure out exactly that. Few weapons have had the same impact on warfare as aircraft carriers once did. In the decades since the Japanese commissioned their first aircraft carrier in 1922, these sea giants have become vital instruments of power projection. U.S. aircraft carriers played a key role in the naval battles of World War II and then in all other wars and conflicts in which the country took part. When a crisis breaks out anywhere in the world today, one of the first questions that comes to mind is, where is the nearest American aircraft carrier? Decades of hard work have allowed the U.S. Navy to field some of the most impressive and expensive ships in history, and the Gerald R. Ford class of supercarriers is no exception. To date, the ships of this class are the most gigantic and expensive in U.S. history. The length of one such carrier is 1,106 feet, longer than three NFL football fields lined up side by side. Its width is about 256 feet, wider than the 224-foot wingspan of a Boeing 747. And at 250 feet, the ship is taller than the iconic 213-foot Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria, which had inspired Disney. The price tag for one such giant turned out to be no less impressive for American taxpayers, amounting to $12.8 billion in expenses on the aircraft carrier itself and another $4.7 billion on research and development work. Although these prices are more relevant for the first ship of the Ford class, the USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, since the U.S. Navy has already spent $11.34 billion on the next ship, USS John F. Kennedy CVN-79. Moreover, this price reduction was made possible not only by some changes in the technological insides of the aircraft carrier, but also by optimizing the design work in general. On average, it took the U.S. about five years to build aircraft carriers, but in the case of the Ford class, the wait was, to put it mildly, prolonged. After all, its construction began in 2009, and it was only commissioned in 2017. On the other hand, looking at the number of innovations it carries, hardly anyone would dare say this long wait was in vain. Even with what this 100,000-ton Atlas inherited from its predecessor class, the Nimitz, it was still modernized and changed beyond recognition. The heart and socket of the CVN-79 supercarrier are two A1B nuclear reactors from Bechtel, responsible for the design of almost all U.S. nuclear engines. They're capable of producing 700 megawatts of thermal power, which is 25% more than the Nimitz reactors whose thermal power is about 550 megawatts. The electrical power will help John F. Kennedy power its new electromagnetic aircraft launch system, or EMOLs, linear induction motor catapults, which are replacing the traditional steam piston catapults used on earlier U.S. Navy aircraft carriers. This system is not only lighter, but also requires much less budget expenditure and attention from technical personnel. Additionally, the military freed up a lot of space below deck, eliminating the need to generate and store steam, and also increased the number of aircraft sorties from the ship per day by 25%. But the main advantage is that it places almost no load on the airframes of the aircraft. This significantly expands the range that the Navy will be able to use from CVN-79, including the latest stealth UAVs. In addition to EMOLs, engineers have found a use for electromagnets in the Advanced Arresting Gear AAG braking system, which replaces the hydraulic mechanism. The decision in favor of AAG was made due to the increasing number of drones used by the U.S. Navy and Air Force, especially in the foreseeable future. The Nimitz's hydraulic systems were unable to capture UAVs without partial damage due to the extreme stress on the airframe, as most drones are too light to operate the large hydraulic piston designed to capture larger aircraft. Now the military can enjoy energy absorption thanks to a turboelectric engine and reduce the impact of the arresting gear on UAV airframes. The service has repeatedly emphasized its intention to regularly increase the number of aircraft that Ford-class carriers can carry. 
For example, if CVN 78 can accommodate from 75 to 90 aircraft, helicopters, and UAVs depending on the configuration and tasks, then when creating CVN 79, there was already talk about transporting 100 aircraft. However, it's still unknown whether the service will be able to achieve this ambitious goal in the second ship of the class or whether it's more realistic to do so in the third aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise CVN-80, whose commissioning is scheduled for 2029. In the meantime, CVN-79 can accommodate the latest Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II fighters, proven Boeing F-A-18 EF Super Hornet fighters, Grumman C-2 Greyhound transports, Boeing EA-18G Growler electronic warfare aircraft, Northrop Grumman E-2 Hawkeye airborne early warning aircraft, and Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawk helicopters. As for drones, so far we're talking about the deployment of Boeing MQ-25 Stingray unmanned refueling drones, which are currently being integrated with EMOS catapults and Gerald R. Ford class arresting gear. The Navy's not exactly hiding the fact that supercarriers will also become a floating home for reconnaissance and attack drones like the once cancelled Northrop Grumman X-47B, which the military may very well bring back. But it's not enough to just launch and land combat aircraft, they need to be armed with something. To that end, the Gerald R. Ford class and CVN-79 in particular received 11 new advanced weapon elevators Oz, powered by the electromagnetic motors with travel speeds up to 150 feet per minute, capable of transporting up to 24,000 pounds of ordnance from the lower decks directly to aircraft waiting above. The main engineering idea here was to ensure that the ammunition did not cross any of the wing's movement zones when moving, reducing potential movement problems inside hangars and on deck to zero. This allowed aircraft to be rearmed in minutes instead of hours, which played a major role in increasing the peak number of sorties per day to 270 compared to 180 sorties for the Nimitz-class predecessors. We're talking not so much about lightning strikes over the course of a couple of days, but rather about protracted conflicts, so the number of sorties over the course of a month will be about 160 per day. The most significant difference between USS John F. Kennedy and her colleague, the USS Gerald R. Ford, was the installation of an updated Enterprise Air Surveillance Radar ESER, system. The decision to switch from dual-band radar DBR, which combined S-band and X-band radars, was not entirely reasonable. After all, with this, CVN-79 did not lose any efficiency and saved American taxpayers over $350 million. Simply put, instead of the overly expensive, difficult to maintain, and redundant DBR, we got an easily scalable, cheaper, and unified radar for different U.S. Navy ships while simultaneously reducing logistics and personnel training costs. Although let's not pretend that we don't mind losing Raytheon's ahead of its time DBR, originally designed for the cancelled futuristic Zumwalt class destroyers. CVN 79's armament includes two REM 162 evolved Sea Sparrow surface to air missile ESSM launchers, two REM 116 rolling airframe missile RAM surface to air missile launchers, three Phalanx close in weapon systems CWIS, four MK 38 25mm machine gun systems, and four of the timeless classic, the M2 Browning 50 caliber machine guns. And in case of a clash with a more technologically savvy rival like China with its DF-21D hypersonic anti-ship missiles, the US is preparing to equip supercarriers with combat lasers and power armor, which the best minds of leading American defense companies are currently working on. And while there have been no convincing updates on the armor yet, testing of laser weapons has been in full swing for several years. For example, more than 10 years ago, the USS Pont successfully tested a 40-kilowatt laser, using it to sink a motorboat, disarm drones, and detonate a rocket-propelled grenade on an approaching vessel. In February of 2025, USS Pebble also successfully completed a high-energy laser with integrated optical dazzler and surveillance Helios test, destroying an unmanned aerial target. However, the laser was first spotted on board Pebble in 2022, where a Phalanx Sea Whiz MK-15 had previously been installed. Helios, being developed by Lockheed Martin, is perhaps one of the most obvious laser weapons options for the Ford class. Here's why. 1. Its power is about 300 kilowatts, which is not too far from the 500 kilowatts required to destroy incoming enemy hypersonic missiles. 2. It integrates well with Aegis, or AN Spy 6, to precisely track and track hostile hypersonic targets. 3. John F. Kennedy's 600 plus megawatts of power is more than enough to power lasers of any power. Therefore, it's safe to say that 
Despite the technological tricks of their enemies, the newest U.S. supercarriers are also trying to keep a couple of aces up their sleeve as an unpleasant surprise for opponents of democracy around the world. CVN-79 is currently still under construction at Newport News Shipbuilding and is expected to be commissioned before the end of 2025. In accordance with the Navy's FY 2025 30-year plan, FY 2025 to FY 2054 shipbuilding plan, the U.S. intends to increase the number of ships with a crew to 381 units, including 12 supercarriers, 10 of which are Gerald R. Ford class. You think aircraft carriers will remain relevant even in the 2050s, in the face of new, less obvious threats of the future? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell for more content like today's. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.